Okay, there's a radio check. A in position, coming your way and left out the building. Audi RS7, great every day, great every day on the track. New technology that puts the power in power steering. And top five car technologies you should nudge your parents to get. It's time to check the tech. We see cars differently. Nice. We love them on the road and under the hood, but also check the tech and are known for telling it like it is. Ugly is included at no extra cost. The good, the bad, the bottom line. This is CNET on Cars. Welcome to CNET on Cars, the show all about high-tech cars and modern driving. I'm Brian Cooley. You know, Audi's RS line is their hottest, but never have they brought to the U.S. an RS as hot as the 560 horsepower RS7. And what I was most surprised by was not just its track prowess, but the fact that it's a total comfortable commuter and, as you know, a high-tech tour de force. <laughs> This is the brawniest Audi RS ever sold in the U.S. And <laughs> it's raining on the track. Let's drive the 2014 Audi RS7. Check the tech. Now the RS7 slots at the top of the stack, above the base A7, above the A7 TDI, even above the S7, which was the previous hot rod king of the hill for this car. Spot one of these pretty readily. Different bumpers, front and rear, are very noticeable and they add two inches to the car's overall length. It's also got a different, very aggressive face and grille. Big old quattro badge here in the front. Out back, look for a different diffuser and very big body exhaust tips. And inside, some pretty hot looking quilted sport seats that I don't believe any other 7 gets. Now, inside, an RS7 doesn't have really anything that another A7 couldn't have. It just is a great place to put all of it. First of all, you got the pop up screen here, which is controlled by their MMI control panel that also has a fingerprint writing or touch panel for radio presets. We've seen this before, like it a lot. And then a lot of things within this system are connected. For example, your maps are through Google Earth, a 25 mile radius that it scoops up for photorealism. When you're looking for an address, you can use Google Online Search to find that. And under the information menu, you've got what they call these Audi Connect services. They still divvy up radio and media in the two buckets, which I think is old school at this point. Optical disc remains in this vehicle. You've got some hard drive space to rip to. They do a nice job laying out meta tags and giving you a very clear way to navigate. Whatever you're listening to goes out through a base 14 speaker, 630 watt Bose surround sound audio rig. You can also option up for nearly six grand Bang & Olufsen sound, which we have noted by the pop-up tweeters. Now this car has built-in internet connectivity through a SIM card right here to a 3G data network, not 4G, and therein lies the rub. Things do tend to move a little slowly if it's rich data. Getting those Google Earth maps loaded, it's a little slow. Retrieving requested information. And they claim you can use the built-in in-car Wi-Fi hotspot to power up to eight devices. Good luck with that. 3G barely powers one device. Luckily, Audi has just announced built-in 4G in their cars, but starting in the entry-level A3. After an initial six months, you'll pay about 17 bucks a month for a gigabyte of data just for the car. Now, the optional tech on this car includes a head-up display, which is pretty good. It's getting in the category of BMW, though not good as BMW M cars. You've also got a button over here that turns on a night vision display between the gauges. It calls out things by heat signature and lets you see, especially on dark roads, if pedestrians or animals are kind of moving around the periphery. Also optional is the driver assistance package, which would include lane departure with a really pronounced stick shaker on the wheel if you drift, about the brightest, most obnoxious blind spot warning lights in the mirrors. I really appreciate them because you actually notice them. An adaptive cruise control that goes all the way down to a full stop and then go again when traffic continues to move. It's a very advanced ACC. We also have not only a backup camera with many different points of view depending on your parking situation, but then when you put the car in go, you also have a front camera with some trajectory lines. 
Now up front, this engine just fascinates me. Four liter V8, twin turbo, it's extremely compact. Check out this architecture here. What's novel about it is in the valley, in the inside of the heads here, you've got the turbos and the exhaust apparatus. The intakes are on the outside of the heads. 560 horsepower, 516 foot-pounds of torque. Car weighs about 4,500 pounds, zero to 60 in 3.7 seconds, while delivering 1627 MPG, which is quite respectable and way outside of gas guzzler territory. One choice on the drive line, it's Quattro, of course, all-wheel drive, and an eight-speed automatic. I know you're cringing right now and saying, wait a minute, what about that dual clutch out of the S7? I think this might actually play out better, as we're going to find out in a moment. Now, another question people have is, wait a minute, how'd they get 140 more horsepower out of this V8 than it has in the S7? Primarily boost. These turbos go up to 17.5 PSI max. In the S7, they're limited to 12.3 PSI. That and all the strengthening and tuning that goes around that does wonders. I'm not fool enough to disengage the stability control, but Quattro has such a good one, it's not that intrusive. The power coming out of this engine is glorious because there's not just a lot of it, but it comes on right away. That's the beauty of doing a big engine with turbos. When you first crack the throttle, you've got plenty of displacement to get things going. That, while the turbos are getting spooled up, and then they push it all the way through like a freight truck. The torque vectoring on the rear and the intelligence of this system makes a damn fool like me Get out of this looking good and in one piece. Now my same love letter goes to the transmission. I know a bunch of you probably were thinking, ah, oh, good grief, it's got an automatic. Why not the DSG dual clutch out of the S7? Because this one's better. It's better in all around everyday driving. It's silky smooth. Then when you get out here, the shifts are plenty quick. Maybe not quite as crisp as that DSG, but they're plenty fast. Now the Quattro system on this guy kind of baselines at 40-60, 40% to the front, 60 to the rear. But it can go as high as 70 front or 85% power to the rear. And it's got the torque vectoring applied to the rear wheels as well. So it'll kind of claw its way out of a corner and turn you the right way. Off the track, you also have a really tractable comfortable commuter car that remains responsive. It doesn't turn into some slug or sloth. It's still taut, but friendly. Note that if you want the really serious sports suspension in this, it's not available in the US RS7 yet that I know of. That's an adaptive, fully mechanical suspension. The base suspension that comes in this guy, which is still very adapted and smart, is air-based. Now the RS7 is of course a specialty model with a very special price, about $106,000 base. You're paying nearly $25,000 more than for an S7 to pick up 140 horsepower, to lose about 0.8 seconds, zero to 60, and to add a gear, the eight-speed automatic versus the seven DSG. What you're really getting when you buy one of these is a bunch of bragging rights as well. Now, to get this CNET style, you gotta add 2,800 bucks for the innovation package. That's gonna bring us the night vision and the head-up display. I like both. Another 2,800 is required then to get the driver assistance package. Adaptive cruise, the lane and blind spot and pre-collision and stop and go. There's a Bang & Olufsen sound system for nearly six grand. I have never heard $6,000 in them that I've listened to, including this one, so I'm gonna pass. And about 180 bucks a year to get those Audi Connect services to work. All in, we're looking at a bit over $111,000, but for what may be the perfect car, if you have the money. Very spacious and utilitarian, got a lot of comfortable room inside for folks, space in the back for stuff. It's brutally fast, extremely capable, and if you do get it on the track, it's gonna make you look good. Now, I wouldn't own anything this expensive or complicated one day out of warranty, but until then, you've got four years during which that grin's gonna actually start to hurt. <laughs> Full review on that Audi RS7 awaits you right now at cars.cnet.com. Well, do a favor for the front end of your car and the back end of the guy you're about to rear end. Get a little better and disciplined about follow distance or adopt some of the technologies that'll handle it for you. These are both of interest to the smarter driver. <laughs>
full 28% of the accidents in the U.S. every year are rear-end collisions, and that probably shouldn't come as any surprise because most of us handle a gap to the car in front of us that we're following and how we glance at it with a combination of past good luck and wishful thinking. So let's apply a little science. The Transportation Research Center at Ohio State did a study of 60 drivers over 6,500 miles, highway and city, to see how they manage the car ahead. First, they tended not to focus on how close that vehicle is, nor how fast they were traveling. They did tend to focus on the rate of gap change. When it's steady, we tend to get complacent and look elsewhere, as if the car ahead would never break because it isn't now. The study found that glances away, when we are following a car directly in front of us, go anywhere from a tenth of a second to about a full second which is substantially shorter than when we're driving and don't have a vehicle directly in front of us, and then it's more like 1.6 to 2 full seconds. But that behavior fails to take into account a lot of things, like what the driver in front of us sees, which we can't see, and also their braking behavior. Do they ride the brakes? Do they moderate them nicely? Do they stab on them only at the last minute when they need to? We get our distance following cues and our prompts to look ahead at the car in front of us in three major categories. First, there's geometry. Things like intersections ahead, grade changes, rail crossings approaching. Those are all fixed things we can see or that are called out by graphical signage. Then come augmenting cues. Here's where you'll find brake lights. Considered augmenting because information you get from brake lights ahead will vary by how the driver uses their brakes. It's not real rigid data. Finally, there are primary cues. This is your own spatial and depth perception of the car ahead and that change in distance and speed. So two major takeaways. First of all, remember that old one car length for every 10 miles per hour of speed rule you've been ignoring since the week you got your license? Turns out it's pretty good. And secondly, since a lot of us don't take into account the gap to the car in front of us, nor the speed at which we're following, we need vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle technology to get in there to more elegantly moderate between vehicles on the road. Right now, we're really putting the gap at a fixed level, even though the dynamics change a lot at different speeds and different amounts of space. As we wait for B2B technology to arrive, a simpler, somewhat cruder technology is becoming more common today, and that is forward collision detection and automatic collision avoidance braking. It's kind of a sledgehammer approach that fixes the bad situations we put cars into in follow distance while we're mostly asleep at the switch. It pays to double check how you manage the gap to the car ahead. Coming up, we demystify the innovations connected to your steering wheel when CNET on Cars rolls on. Um, you've got to think of John Cooper Works as sort of Mini's version of BMW's M division. You get more power, it's more handling and driver focused, and basically a little bit more fun for a little bit more money. So this car itself has a 1.6 litre turbocharged engine, and that's got 211 brake horsepower. The final gripe is a bit of a biggie, especially if you're going to undertake journeys like this. Find more from the XCAR team of CNET UK at cnet.com slash XCAR. Welcome back to CNET on Cars, coming to you from our home here at the Marin Clubhouse of Cars de Widiac, just north of the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, for the longest time, power steering meant a constantly squealing pump driven by an engine sapping belt, sending power out to a usually leaky power ramp. Not very elegant. But lately, power steering's become electrified, and along the way, it got a lot more than just cleaner. Makes for a good CarTech 101. In the beginning, there was only one kind of steering. You want to move the car a different direction? You grab the steering wheel and put your shoulder into it. Power steering was either unheard of or very elite. Steering a heavy vehicle by manual effort only emphasized the need for a steering assist. We huffed and heaved and sweated behind the wheel until the first mainstream car with power steering hit showrooms. The 1951 Chrysler Imperial, 
with something that they called Hydra Guy. And then for 50 years, power steering didn't really change a lot. Hydraulic was hydraulic, like on this 67 Cougar. You basically have your steering rack that is very classic in just about every car of the era. But to help you move that, you've got this power ram right up here. This piece is nothing more than a hydraulic ram that pushes one way or the other to get your wheels to move which way you want. It is told how much and what direction by this control valve up here, and all this connects to your steering column. Where does it get all the pressure is what's interesting. If you look up in there, you see that pump. That's the power steering pump run by a belt off the front of the engine. That's one of the big problems with these systems. It's constantly putting drag on the engine, creating a bunch of pressure, even if you're not using it to steer. That's called a parasitic loss. That can sap MPG and power. But these days, power steering has changed dramatically. Welcome to the era of EPAS, electric power-assisted steering. Now underneath this 2014 Jeep Cherokee, a decidedly modern vehicle, we find a very different steering system. Electric power steering is here. If you look up in this vicinity, you're going to see the electric motor which is sitting on the steering rack, those arms and linkages that move the wheels left and right. Another model is to take that motor and move it further up and put it on the actual steering column, kind of heading up toward the firewall. The effect is the same. The electric motor and its electronics sense your effort on the wheel and add their own in kind in, of course, the same direction. The efficiency, the compactness, the cleanliness, and the accuracy of this system versus hydraulic is the big idea. Note there are also hybrid systems that remain hydraulic but replace the belt-driven pump with an electric one. The bigger trend, however, is to go fully electric. Okay, so as you've picked up on, there are four major benefits to electric power steering. Let's run them down. First off is efficiency. ZF, which makes a lot of electric power steering systems, says they can save 90% of the energy that is parasitically wasted by hydraulic systems. Put another way, Chevy says their 2013 Malibu gets 2.5% better MPG solely because it has electric power steering. They ballpark that at 120 gallons of gas or about 500 bucks saved across 10 years of ownership. Next up is addressability. Because it's an electric component, it can be harnessed to the vehicle's control systems to automate things like automatic parking assistance, lane departure correction, all kinds of things that are nudging into the area of autonomous driving. It can also be used in the background for cornering improvement and cornering control. Now we have accuracy. Because it's driven largely by software, changing its behavior and keeping it accurate with a feedback loop that a computer can monitor is quite easy. That's not the case with hydraulic systems. If you want to change their behavior, you largely have to go engineer new physical components for them. And then there's compactness, a big deal with automotive packaging designers. Instead of having a pump and belts and valves and a power ram, you just have an electric motor and some wires going to and from it. That allows a lot of space to be freed up and for things to be kept very compact and very cool in the engine bay. So it's a win, 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 win. Then why do so many driving purists kind of push back on electric power steering. Well, part of it is because it's not what we've always had. It's not hydraulic, and let's face it, we've all gotten used to hydraulic steering and automakers have dialed it in quite nicely. And early electric power steering systems did have some numbness to them and some poor what's called on-center feel. That's been largely corrected in my experience. I have a very hard time telling a good electric system from a refined hydraulic system until I look under the hood. The future? When electric power steering like we've seen today becomes steer-by-wire electric power steering. That means the steering wheel basically becomes a game controller and has no mechanical connection to the front end at all. That's down the road a few years, and that's a separate CarTech 101. In a moment, I'll tread dangerous waters, automatic versus manual, when CNET on Cars returns. Hybrid cars aren't new in endurance racing, but Porsche has been biding its time with this car. What's most interesting about this car, though, is its hybrid system, because, yeah, it's becoming the norm in motorsport. But when you take a look at Porsche's road portfolio, you'll see that this has been worked on for years. Take a look at the Porsche Panamera SE Hybrid. In the UK, it'll manage over 90 miles to the gallon. This is one of those instances where road and race come together 
for the greater good. Find more from the XCAR team of CNET UK at CNET.com slash XCAR. Welcome back to CNET on Cars. I'm Brian Cooley. Time for one of your emails. This one comes in from Steve P in Rochester who writes in, the thinking has always been that a manual transmission is the proper way to drive a car, the purest's way. I myself, he says, do not drive a manual, at least not adequately. So does that mean that I'm missing out? He asks, am I some spoiled softy who doesn't really know how to drive a car? Yes. Now a top five. <laughs> Kidding, Steve. Uh, in fact, I'm happy to tell you and your idle left foot that you are in good company. Automatics dramatically outsell manuals in the U.S. and they have for decades. However, the automaker is tending toward the automatic globally because it can be tied into the car's overall computerized systems. You can optimize the vehicle with software when the automatic is in on the game, if you will. It's a controllable transmission. The manual is not. That throws a wrench in the works, if you will, of what the automaker's goals are for performance, MPG, and emissions. So look for the trend to continue toward automatics or dual-clutch automated manuals. And don't forget, Ferrari doesn't even make a manual anymore. All their cars are more or less an automatic transmission. Now, I get a lot of requests for this next top five. Technology you can nudge your parents to get in their next car so they don't have a crash and hurt themselves, hurt someone else, or blow your inheritance in a civil settlement. Here's my top five things you can put in their car, keep them safe, and make them feel kind of cool and techy at the same time. I'm going to rank these according to how well the technology can help. And along the way, I'll give you some interesting U.S. federal stats that show the kinds of trouble older drivers get into. Number five is failing to yield. Failing to yield at an intersection or blowing a stop or red light is charged in some 37% of elder accidents. But I rank this low because technology to help a lot is still pending. That would be vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications that will let cars signal each other to avoid a collision. The U.S. government is set to launch rules likely in 2014, but it wouldn't be in cars for several years after that. Meantime, remind Dad it doesn't matter who had the right of way. The real win is not getting into a crash. Number four, inattentiveness or lost in thought. Definitely the most poetically described thing I've ever seen in government research. It's not a huge portion of driver distraction. Most older drivers actually don't drive distracted. But now we do have tech from Ford, Mercedes, BMW, and Volvo to detect and alert driver drowsiness. What we are missing still is something to get inside the head of drivers, old or otherwise, and just refocus their attention when they're wide awake. Number three, side impacts. Left and right side hits amount to about 30% of all elder crashes when sorted by impact angle. Two technologies can help here. The first is passive or active blind spot technology. Now, if it's passive, make sure the warning lights are big and visible, like I find in Audis. If mom and dad seem to always be cutting off, let's say, a bike on the right-hand side, then look into Honda's cars that have a camera that looks down the right side of the vehicle when you signal that way. My second tech tip is kind of low-tech. It's a car that has clean sight lines, out the A-pillars. These are the ones that hold up the front of the windshield. Now, there are big differences in these between cars. Generally, the more sloped and thicker the A-pillar, the more stuff you can completely lose behind it until it's too late. Number two, rear end collisions. This is a big one for older drivers. A few years ago, mom and dad would have had to have been fairly moneyed to get technology help here. Today, no longer the case. It's not just Volvos, Mercedes, and Infinities that have forward collision tech. Look at Subaru's EyeSight, a great example of an affordable car with camera tech that can sense a forward collision and break all the way down to a dead stop if need be to prevent a rear ender. And it works at closing speed deltas of up to 19 miles per hour, which is quite a bit. Before I get you to number one, evidence that 60 really is the new 50. Drivers in their 60s are actually not involved in a lot more accidents with other cars. In fact, they're less involved than people in their teens and 20s. Now, it's the 70s and 80s where things get rough, and drivers over 80 have five times the accident risk compared to people in their 40s and 50s. That's the red zone. The number one place where tech can help your folks is backing up. Whether their necks are too stiff to turn around and look, or their eyes are too bad to see anything if they do, backing up is a problem for old folks, adding up to some 23% of crash impact points. 
A rear cam in their car is a must. Now, they are likely to become required on new cars in a couple of years, but they already show up on most new cars already. So this will be one less argument you have to have when your parent says, oh, I don't need that. Yes, you do. In the meantime, convince them that they have to have it, and a surround camera option might not hurt either. But I find the display zones on those tend to be awfully small. That rear cam is the big one. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Let me know your thoughts and send me the ideas of topics that you want us to cover. That's a big part of what drives the show. It's on cars at CNET.com. I'll see you next time we check the tech. Oh, that looks great. What a great shot.